Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Michael Parsons, as you gather from the program and chair of this event, which means I'm hoping not to be very much, so leave it to, to Roger and Vincenzo. Uh, meet the author, it's called. The author that we're going to meet is Roger Kennedy, who's uh, sitting uh, at the end. Uh, a very distinguished and significant figure uh, in British psychoanalysis. Roger is um, a training and supervising analyst in the British Society, a former president uh, of the British Society, and one of the most productive uh, authors that we have. Uh, I've lost count of the number of books you've written, Roger. I think Eleven. it's six or seven. Eleven. <laughs> Sorry. Eleven. <laughs> 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 There are, there are so many because Roger operates in, in so many different fields. He's a practicing clinical analyst in private practice. He's also a playwright and uh, creative short story novelist. And for almost 30 years now, he's been running the family department at the Castle Hospital, which is a unique institution in Britain. Uh, which offers inpatient treatment to complete families who have such a serious level of disturbance that that's what they need. And so Roger has so many screens to his work. I think it's going to be very interesting to hear from him about his work and to discuss it with him. Uh, and first of all, Roger is going to talk for a bit. And then uh, Vincenzo Bonamino, just on my left here, will also give us um, some thoughts about Roger's work. Vincenzo is a training and supervising analyst of the Italian Psychoanalytic Society, a former vice president of the European <coughs> Federation, and a past president of the Rome Psychoanalytic Center, which is a branch of the Analytic Society, and also well known for his writings and connection with international psychoanalytic thought. So Roger, shall I ask you to start this off? <coughs> Thanks very much, uh, Mike, for that very generous introduction. It was very kind of you. Thank you. Um, w what I'm going to do is just talk for a little bit mm. uh, uh, about, first of all, um, some of my psychoanalytic work and partly based on, since it's Meet the Author, <laughs> on this book, The Many Voices of Psychoanalysis, uh, then I, what I thought I'd do is read a little snippet from a book of short stories, Count Tales, which I'll also explain. So you have a little snippet of, of that. Um, I mean, The Many Voices of, psych of Psychoanalysis, I mean, it refers to, first of all, the field of psychoanalysis, all the many sometimes disparate voices, many disparate voices there are, different theories, uh, different, way, different approaches, but also really clinically about listening to the patient and the voices that you can hear coming from the patient, <coughs> maybe the different caretakers, different figures in their life. The, I, the, I, the concept of the many voices came from a, a number of different influences. One of them actually was uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, the uh, Russian literary theorist, in, who talked about Dostoevsky, and uh, he described that Dostoevsky's way of writing novels was dialogic, uh, that there were many voices in, in a kind of polyphony of interpenetrating voices, as opposed to, say, Tolstoy, who had a powerful one strong voice. And if you read Dostoevsky's novels, they're often, a lot of them, just dialogue. And, um, and out of the dialogue creates the characters and the dramas. So uh, it was partly that. Partly also looking at history and listening to the many voices from the past. Fro bringing, and psychoanalysis is very much about bringing frozen voices to life. I, this is a phrase of Michelet, the French historian, bringing frozen voices to life. And... Um, in a way, I think I've also been influenced uh, by a whole lot of different European voices. So it's quite nice to be invited to this uh, encounter, really, in a European conference. What I thought I'd do is just go over a few themes um, that 
I'm obviously not going to give a paper, just a brief summary of the thinking in the last 30 years that's influenced me and some of the key themes maybe. The first thing would be uh, independent thinking, independent psychoanalytic thinking. And that's my kind of tradition in, within the British society. Um, and it, to summarize that, and I have to say the reason I, I start with that, because when I wrote this book, I, before the introduction, and one of the, the readers from America really couldn't understand what I was talking about. Um, he was kind of interested and gave some very useful comments, but just couldn't understand where I was coming from at all. So it was really important to explain what independent thinking was. So I had to put that in in the introduction. So it's rooted in Freud's classical theory and technique, respect for ideas wherever they come from, so a multiplicity of viewpoints, the many voices there again, the development of the psyche within its environment, very much a developmental model is useful, the need to keep an emotional contact with the patient and to be open to uncertainty. Interpretations don't come from on high, except occasionally, <laughs> but, uh, but out of the relationship or from wherever they come from. The, an aim for joint working where possible. A search for means to be in a position to receive and understand the patient's unconscious communications most appropriately through understanding and interpretations of transference and counter-transference but also bearing states of unknowing and openness to the unknown. Interpretations as arising in order to facilitate access to the unconscious. And a focus on the analyst's receptivity. It's rather like musical appreciation. It's the quality of attentive listening to both the expressed and the non-expressed voices. And here I have to say I've been deeply influenced by people like Mike Parsons and other colleagues whom We've been in dialogue for many, many years since our training, really. We began training together, and we've been meeting from time to time ever since in all kinds of different ways. Um, the second theme I've called psychic home and identity. Um, so ha that's where I start from. That's my kind of analytic home, but also I have a concept I've been developing recently of a psychic home. A psychic home refers to having an internal sense of a secure home base which provides a central organizing psychic structure for the sense of identity, for who we are. Such a home base is built up from a number of different elements, as with the physical home, which forms its substrate. So the psychic home is made out of, a, first of all, basic physical structure of a home as a protected space for shelter, providing the core of the internalized psychic home something with an interior. Secondly, there's already a pre-established symbolic space predating setting up of a psychic home. A home-to-be already has a place in the family history and narrative already situated in a complicated network of relationships. Thirdly, the contents of the psychic home, its mental furniture, consists essentially of identifications with family members making up the home's interior. And lastly, the home consists of activities what I call the work of the day around significant events in everyday life. So the psychic home um, made up of a number of different interacting elements and is the starting point for a sense of forming an identity. To quote Winnicott, home is the place we start from. So I started from my analytic base in a way and try to understand it through that the, uh, the notion of a psychic home is central to identity. The third kind of theme in my, my work is about freedom. Freedom as basic to the psychoanalytic enterprise. Patients come wishing to be free from symptoms, free to live their life in some way, wanting a fuller life. There is freedom from, from some kind of restraint, compulsion or limitation of thought and action. That's negative freedom, to quote Isaiah Berlin. The absence of obstructions and possible, to possible choices and activities. But there's also freedom too, positive freedom. A positive notion of what it is to be free, which I've called in a, an earlier book, freedom to relate. It's about relational bonds between subjects and other, and it's been crucial. So freedom is not just a subjective feeling, but 
It's about um, a domain within which choice is formed under some restraint. Freedom involves a combination of positive and negative aspects. So we've moved to the next key theme is hum the human aspects of the psychotic situation which I think are linked to freedom and the sense of a psychic home and identity. Here's the influence of my analyst John Clauber who was very much interested in this, uh, the human aspects. Too much concentration on the method of psychoanalysis ignores the personal factor, though it's central to its method, determining what the analyst selects for interpretation, in what way he views what he selects, and even what the patient brings. Yet there still remains, even after all these years of his work, a profound fear about acknowledging the personal element. I've summarized those, and Vincenzo will talk more, I think, about this, about fear of seduction, the need to interpret, the strain of restraint, and the fear of spontaneity. These are some of the kind of subheadings in the book that uh, in the chapter on the human aspects are looked at in more detail. I also look at humour and irony, which uh, is absolutely essential to keep sane, really, isn't it? Um, so, being oneself as an analyst this is a personal issue, and it's about identity as well. For Clauber, there was the need to find a balance between the discipline of training and the need to feel oneself, to feel at home, feel at home in one's professional uh, role, as well as finding a professional home in a psychoanalytic society, or some bit of it. Mike Parsons has talked about the identity of the analyst is, is, relates to the relationship with her and unconscious. A trust in the unconscious is being central. And he talks about freedom and flexibility within a discipline, which is very much one of his themes going back many years. So a psychoanalytic identity involves both feeling at home in one's role and in an institution, but there's also, it's also necessary to pull away from feeling too settled in one's home, in one's position. It doesn't pay creatively to be too comfortable in one's position. Indeed, there are many very creative analysts who seem to live on the margins and don't like being pulled into the central core of the home. I've always found a need to be, you know, at home and in the home. For me, home is very important in many ways. So I found being on the margins, although I tend to go that way, I also tend to want to go into the centre uh, for my own sense of who I am. Fifthly, I've talked uh, at some length in the, in the elusive human subject um, of a theory of the, hu of, of the subject, a theory of subjectivity. I, for those of you who went to Gregorio's discussion uh, paper this morning, there was some hint of this between the, uh, the German uh, discussant who talked about alterity, the otherness, and Gregorio talked about what we're dealing with is the subject in relation to the other. And I've tried to theorize about that at some length. And I suppose we are, as analysts, dealing with the elusive area between the subject and the other, the elusive, I call the elusive human subject. The psychoanalytic encounter, so I'm nearly finished now, is more about striving to become a subject than about having objects. Freud's discoveries were very much about bringing back into the realm of the subject elements of the mind, such as dreams and fantasies, which had been devalued still are in some ways, and uh, devalued as mere objects of some kind of objective knowledge or as of no consequence. The obsession with evidence-based medicine is still, we're still struggling with this uh, uh, attitude. As the analyst is not actually available as an object for a real relationship, hopefully, the analyst setting sets in motion a complex search for the human subject. My concept of subject relations, and here I was also influenced by Christopher Bollas, with whom we've also been in discussions on and off in his various moves for many, many years, um, talked about this for the first time, and I've tried to define it more clearly. And looking for when the subject first emerges, when subjectivity emerges, my view of the subject involves looking at the social field and networks of subjects and interaction. And that means looking at sociology and so, um, social structure. For me, subjects meet other subjects at contact points. 
I talked about the subjective organisation beyond the individual as such, which involves the social. Whatever we have in our minds, and that is very important of course, we need the network of other subjects for our minds to become organised. So the term subject captures the basic dual aspect of the human situation. We are both subject of and subject to various phenomena. So the term refers, the term subject, both to our sense of I who we are, our identity, our psychic home, our individual identity, uh, and that we can be the subject of the authors of our actions and our history. But at the same time, it also indicates that we are subject to various forces outside the speaking eye, forces both from the individual and from the environment, from the network of other subjects. Being a subject, and this is what we're helping patients, hopefully, to become subjects, involves some capacity to take up different positions, not just being fixed in one position, not just being frozen in one way of being, but try to have some freedom to move between different um, <coughs> positions. And um, in a way, that's what I think we're trying to do. The analyst is poised at the point at which human subjectivity emerges and a voice, a true voice, begins to be heard. So that's my trying to link up 30 years of work in, <laughs> in some kind of theme of um, moving from independent thought to identity, home, subject relations, and freedom and the human aspect. Now, the, um, my other self is the, uh, the, the, the trying to be a literary writer. Um, I used to write for the theatre. I've just right written the games for some reason. Something's happened again. I don't know what's been happening to my head, but there we are. And I wrote these stories. And um, actually, they're about an imaginary psychoanalyst and imaginary patients. So, and this analyst, it starts with this analyst sitting in his consulting room waiting for a patient who is late. And the idea of writing short stories comes to him while he's waiting. And so the book is about the short stories he writes about his patients. And they are imaginary. They're not my patients, obviously. They are. They're an amalgam of fantasy mm -hmm. and whatever. But, but in between the stories, the analyst writes a journal about his thoughts about the patients and his stories and his life, which begins, this is a man in his mid-40s, I've long passed that time, <laughs> um, in a crisis. And so the journal in charts his increasing crisis with his wife and his life and what the stories have brought up for him. So that's, I hope you'll be interested in, in that. So if I may, shall I read just to it, just a little snippet of, um, it's paid on, page 105. I wasn't sure what to, to uh, read out, but this is, as this is an analytic conference, this is perhaps something that um, would be most easy to identify. It's, it's called The Country Practice. It's about a, a GP who uh, actually has a relationship with his patient in the end, but I don't get to that point in this snippet. Okay. I once knew a country doctor who found himself making a delicate choice about his personal life. I shall begin with the dream he had one Saturday morning in the summer. The doctor felt in the dream that his head was divided into two parts by a kind of ridge. The back part was covered with neatly combed dark hair and looked healthy and vibrant, like newly laid turf that had been generously watered and has taken root. The hair in the front part, however, was thin and dry. His face in the dream expressed pain and grief, revealing many dense furrows, crisscrossing like parched and cracked earth. In the distance, someone was holding a large knife with a guillotine-shaped blade. The blade leaped out of its handle and hovered over the doctor's head with the two parts joined. Suddenly, it took off into the, took off into the sky, came down at great speed and split his head in two. He awoke with a start, holding his head as if to keep it from falling apart. Once he was conscious enough to realise that it was intact, and that his hair was still thick and healthy, he breathed a sigh of relief. A shaft of bright sunlight pierced through a gap in the bedroom curtains and caught him in the eye. He let out a groan, closed his eyes again and searched with his hands for his wife, Elaine, but in vain, because she was already up. He felt empty and lonely, feelings which had become only too familiar to him lately. 
But as he gradually woke up, his anguish abated and he crawled out of bed to face the day. Dr. Ben Chambers was 43, a general practitioner based in a village in Dorset, that's in uh, West England, and was married with three children, sons of 15 and 10 and a daughter of 12. He was a smallish, energetic man, a neat, if unimaginative dresser, and reserved in personal encounters. As a doctor, he had grown used to listening to others, and perhaps as a result, really allowed himself a degree of open expression of his own feelings. However, although his inner life was kept rather closed, it was full of doubt and confusion. He attained some relief by immersing himself in his work, but recently he had been having a series of troubling dreams which were upsetting his precarious equilibrium. The image of the split head continued to hover over him as he began to dress for his Saturday morning surgery, choosing a light green tweed jacket and brown corduroy trousers. He glanced through the bedroom window, taking in the ample garden. Although only mildly warm, it was a bright early summer's day. The sky was already a deep blue, with only a few threads of thin cloud perched on high. Just as he took a deep breath to clear his head, he saw his wife pinning some washing on the line. In the past, the mere sight of her small black panties and brassiere hanging there would have excited him. But now instead he felt a sharp stabbing pain in his head, just where the dream knife had cut through, as he recalled that it was months since either of them had felt the desire to make love. As he brushed his hair rather gingerly, for he still felt that his head was vulnerable and tender, his youngest child, Simon, sailed into the room, fondling a pair of white mice. Dad, Geraldine doesn't look well. She won't use the wheel. Dad, can you have a look? I'm not a vet, Simon. It's all the same, isn't it? Simon replied with conviction. Let's have a look then. Simon put one mouse into a trouser pocket and offered up the other one to his father's clinical gaze. Look, Dad, said Simon, giving the mouse a little nudge in the ribs and abdomen and running his fingers down its little limbs. She was all right last night, but when I woke up this morning, she was all floppy. Well, you know, Simon, mice often get ill. But you can cure her, can't you? He replied confidently. The father had to admit to himself that he still found his son's touching belief in his omnipotence very gratifying. So unlike the attitude of his other children, who had become quite sceptical of his accomplishments and capacities. Well, I'll bring home some antibiotics from the surgery. I think Geraldine has a chest infection. Will you listen to her with your stethoscope, Dad? Of course, Simon. Can I listen too? Of course. Chambers had been having a number of awkward and wayward thoughts recently, which involved escaping from his family. He now felt guilt spread over him in uncomfortable waves as his son bounced out of the room with the ailing mouse cuddled lovingly in his hands. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, Vincenzo, do you want to let us hear what you have to say? I feel honored, of course, to be tonight uh, to comment Dr. Kennedy's contribution to psychoanalysis. Uh, and the feeling of honor is increased by the fact that I share this task with Dr. Michael Parson, who also chaired the session. Uh, of course, I would have loved to talk, uh, just adding some uh, sheets to rely upon, but it is impossible for me to do this uh, in English. Uh, and uh, so I will be stick on my text. But uh, let me add something that uh, I associated with what uh, Roger said uh, before about uh, <coughs> having a house, uh, living into a house, which uh, reminds me, of course, uh, uh, the title of uh, a famous uh, book by Winnicott, uh, Home is where we start from. And uh, also, if Sipa uh, Valichet, I recently wrote a paper which is very akin to the, the argument that uh, Roger uh, afforded, which is named uh, The Indwelling of the Psyche in the Soma, relying mainly on what Winnicott says about uh, the basic integrity of the person, and uh, you need to be one person if you have your psyche, so to say, inside your soma, but Winnicott says that this is not 
cannot be given for granted because uh, there are a lot of processes that are to be taken by the environment in order for the child to be uh, um, inside his uh, soma. So I think that there is a, a kind of association because uh, what uh, Roger said about the elaboration of feeling at home, uh, of, of being uh, um, easy in his own uh, environment is something which has to do with this basic process which we got uh, told about. Another uh, free association, if Michael allowed me to, to do so, is, uh, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, is uh, that I was wondering, do we need people like Roger Kennedy or Michael Parson or Kip Bolas or uh, other uh, distinguished analysts to remind ourselves that uh, analysis is uh, mainly a very natural thing to do with patient and how it is possible that uh, uh, psychoanalysis has become in many cases so dogmatic so that we need voices like the, those of Roger or Michael or other voices in order to retrieve the spontaneity of uh, uh, being psychoanalyst and I am reminded, I am associating, so sorry if I am not precise of uh, reading uh, many, many times uh, what Freud says in uh, recommendation to the practitioner uh, for beginning psychoanalysis. And uh, what is incredible is that from this kind of paper, we can say that uh, the, the dogmatic way of uh, 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 conducting psychoanalysis uh, uh, arose. And one can uh, wonder why it was possible if Freud himself says, uh, for example, explaining why he uses the coach. Uh, I use the coach because, of course, there is a tradition uh, in the therapy of psychoanalytic uh, treatment of hysteric. But mainly, Freud says, I use the coach because I hate to be stared at by patient for 13 uh, days, uh, hours a day. So it is a very natural feeling at home with the patient, which Freud was conveying. And I wonder how it is possible that uh, uh, for many years in psychoanalysis it, there was a debate about if psychoanalysis is true analysis for if it has five sessions, four sessions, three sessions per week. I mean, something which is not the center core of psychoanalytical uh, endeavor. So now I must rely on my text because I cannot go on uh, otherwise. Um, I, I was uh, telling before that I feel very honored to be between uh, Roger and Michael Parson because both voices are, in my view, among the most relevant in contemporary psychoanalysis and specifically among the newest and freshest voices coming from the British psychoanalytic tradition to which we all, or most of us, feel indebted to, for the richness of exploration in our field, both clinically and theoretically. Roger Kennedy's main book, I didn't know that he published about 11 books, uh, published in uh, 207, um, in the new library of psychoanalysis is the many voices of psychoanalysis and in this book well represents his psychoanalytic stance, well represents his attitude as a person and as a psychoanalyst. By attitude I mean here how he relates to our discipline, to the clinical everyday work with the patient in the consulting room and now it relates to our discipline as a corpus of theories and models. An open-minded one is the adjective that I would associate with Roger Kennedy attitude. Let's listen, if, even though very briefly after the beautiful reading, let's listen to how Roger Kennedy utters his very first voice at the very beginning of the book. Hardly, I think, one can find in a few lines such a synthetic and meaningful sense of what the whole book is about. 
the very few lines with which uh, the book starts are finding one's voice as a psychoanalyst takes a considerable amount of time. It is hoped that what takes place over the years is the development of a particular quality of listening. The latter not only picks up the patient unconscious communication, but also comes from the analyst's own increasing sense of knowing what they are doing, even when not knowing what is going on in the session. They are then listening to the patient and to themselves with the complex interaction between the two sides. I will stop here because uh, in order to avoid to be too long. I have just said that the many voices of psychoanalysis were represented in psychoanalytic stance. I mean the title itself, which he may have chosen accurately, apart from the content which is so rich of themes, argument, personal consideration, so clinical, clinically grounded and spanning within a large spectrum of most relevant key points of contemporary psychoanalytic debate, but this title has a particular value in my view. It is certainly a fresh and rather unique and singular voice in the clamor of this debate in psychoanalytical panorama. Let me take the liberty to emphasize once more and further the value of the title and the accuracy with which it was chosen by Roger Kennedy because I want to put in evidence the over-determination or multiple determination of meanings that the term voices imply in this context. As we have just heard from Roger Kennedy's own voice, even though in a different words, as psychoanalysts at work in the consulting room, we are inside a technical dispositive, which is actually the system of listening invented by Freud, and which is not only a question of soul technique indeed, a dispositive of listening we are trained for and acquainted with, mainly as our clinical experience increases. This dispositive, which privileges uh, the acoustic side of the analyst hearing of the analysis and talking, is built to say to listen to our analysis and voice. How it is that we need a special dispositive to listen to our analysis and voice? This question is implicit in Roger's argument. Most of the time, there are many voices in the single analysis, not only in the development of the psychoanalytical process, but often in the very same session. Who is talking now? Whose voice the patient is uttering? Whose voice is bear of in this moment? This question, which was brought forward by Paula Hyman, uh, is crucial in understanding the many voices which are speaking in the session, the analysis and voice, and the analyst voices. Hearing voices, Henry Smith would say this. And I would remind you that uh, another author who, who was mentioned both by Michael and by Roger, Kit Bolas, initiates his book, the first book, The Shadow of the Object, uh, specifically on this topic. Uh, how psychoanalysis, in particular, how um, British psychoanalysis changed with this fundamental question which Paula Eyman put. Who is talking now? Who is speaking now? Who is speaking this patient to? There are also the analyst inner voices in the consulting room. His inner work of elaboration was to take into account his own reaction to the patient in that moment when the analyst says to himself, what is she is telling me now and why? Whose part of me is talking to in the transference? How did he listen to what I told him a moment before, yesterday, one week ago, if she is speaking this way? And by this I mean that uh, I don't believe, as I will uh, uh, underline if I have time, that really we can have what uh, the British tradition called the here now interpretation because uh, the process of uh, uh, listening to the voices of the patient and the voices inside the analyst is a very um, is 
a problem which takes a, a very large span of time, so it is impossible and uh, non-realistic to believe that we are able to respond to the patient in that precise moment. There is, of course, the apricot, the naphtraglicide, but also the elaboration of the patient. This is another reason why I do like and appreciate the title of Roger Kennedy's book and what it conveys inside it, by giving an open-minded view of how the analyst has to listen to the many voices coming from the patient and from inside himself, and how to cast the appropriate voice, the good enough interpretation to the patient. The many voices of psychoanalysis are also those ones which steer the contemporary psychoanalytic debate and which are often concurrent competitive models. Some of them would even purport to be omnicomprehensive and who would establish themselves <coughs> as a substitute of the entire psychoanalytic doctrine, which is multifaceted, even though, as Freud advised us, no one can pull out from the building of the theory a single part and emphasize it without being preoccupied uh, about what happens to the entire construction if a piece is subtracted, stolen and changed. It is impressive to see how Roger Kennedy is able to take into account the many voices within psychoanalytic theory, how he is updated even though beneficially selective and how his own contribution stems out originally from a deep understanding of what are the basic problems in contemporary psychoanalytic debate. Roger Kennedy is able to enucleate from the background noise those voices which are the authentic ones, the, the meaningful ones. One final point which makes me love the multi-layered multi semantic meanings implied in the declaration that there are many voices in psychoanalysis. It is, not only, it is not only by chance that we have two different, even though intertwin, voices coming out from Roger Kennedy as a person. The voice of the, anal of the analyst who casts his well-balanced point of view on what happens in the psychoanalytic encounter and the voice of the storyteller, the novelist, whose intriguing écriture is well and beautiful represented by his coach tales, of which he has given just a beautiful example, a lovely readable book which I can only make a passing reference to for time limitation. Let me now enlist and briefly discuss some of the key points I have enucleated from the many ones he mentioned, those who are more meaningful to me. It is not to be compliant with Michael Parson, who is here and who is an authoritative author, that I want to say that I would, it would be lovely to show how on many points, as they themselves were telling before, Michael's and Roger's are a sonata a due mani, even though this, their originality of their own views is well preserved. I would love to put it into evidence in a sort of duet how they afford overlapping issues of the clinical practice, how do they are in the same stream, but how they swim independently, which is a beneficial characteristic of the independent thinking. It is only for reason of time and because the author to be met is Roger, if I am not able to make mainly for limitation of time, and accoppiata by matching them together. And I will stop here now if you okay. agree okay. and then we can continue. Okay. okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you. I think given us a very good entry into the, the feeling of Roger's work and the, the overall quality of it. One thing um, I was very glad uh, to be reminded of in one of your quotations from the beginning of Roger's book of many voices uh, about the analyst gradually coming to 
be able to know what he's doing even when he doesn't know what's mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And that seems a very, a very good phrase. I mean, it captures Roger's pithy uh, writing and it's, it's very kind of spot on about a particular thing that's, that's needed. And I was thinking, one of Roger's earlier books is called The Elusive Human Subject, and you were saying something, Roger, about the importance of the notion of the subject, and uh, becoming a subject is one of the chapters in the, uh, in the book. But I was thinking how important the word elusive is in the title of that book. To be able to accept that certain things are elusive and what it is, you know, human subjectivity uh, as something that can't be pinned down uh, in uh, a kind of uh, research evidence based demands for a kind of. Uh, again, I was reminded of Gregorio Kovan's paper uh, this morning that you referred to as well, where he quotes the story from uh, by Blanchot. Uh, which turns on the phrase, but tell me what really happened, or tell us everything that really happened, and how that's a demand that can't be fulfilled, but by subjecting oneself to it, you see what kind of exploration is possible. And, uh, you, know, you capture how much that's what psychoanalysis is about. But I think we haven't quite covered yet in either what Roger or Vincenzo has said just how many voices there are in this book of Roger's and uh, you know, how, many, how many voices Roger speaks with uh, because alongside the allowing things to be elusive I just want to mention another area of Roger's work where he has had to learn to be extremely specific and speak with a very clear voice, knowing exactly what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's in your court work, Roger, because of the work with families that Roger's done at the council. Uh, Roger has become a very significant figure uh, in the world of family law in uh, uh, England. Roger's appeared many times in the law courts as an expert witness in cases where very difficult decisions have to be made about families and uh, the, the judges in the family court rely a lot on being very influenced by the way that Roger can bring psychoanalytic understanding to bear on the kind of legal decisions and very precise and clear-cut ways that uh, judges and lawyers have to think about these things. And I've admired the way you managed to uh, have the elusive property of psychoanalysis present in a way that these very necessarily cut and dried <laughs> thinkers can actually make use of. And I, I'm hoping that may be something that we can hear about, but you know, no more from me at the moment. I'll, I'll just open the uh, discussion to the floor and see what comments or questions or thoughts any of us may have that Roger and Vincenzo may be able to respond to. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I could talk about the court for a bit if you want. Do, if you yeah. Want to, that would be but it is strange, as you rightly say, that um, on the one hand, you know, here I am talking about all this elusive subject and the fact that in the analytic setting, it's very important to uh, allow freedom and uncertainty, but you also have to be precise <laughs> and have your feet on the ground as well, and. Um, and that's true, I think, of writing, that, uh, that um, and I, th I know a number of my patients, particularly, let's say, more trainee-type people, when they come to see me, they're expecting some kind of um, uh, intellectual, whatever it is, and when I, I'm very <laughs> down-to-earth and ordinary and make comments about their behavior or their, what they're telling, t telling me in quite ordinary ways, I try and avoid, personally, jargon as much as possible and keep it really very simple. 
And I think that comes partly from well, me, but also from working at the castle for so many years, um, where we, we have such disturbed families, patients, and we have to uh, provide a framework for them to get their lives together. Um, their homes, their psychic homes are broken down. And um, for a variety of reasons, <coughs> child abuse, depression, sometimes major psychosis, very occasionally. Um, and the work of the nursing is very much about everyday life. I call the work of the day, the ordinary everyday life that is broken down in many of these families. And trying to piece together the work of the day uh, is, is really uh, very important. The, the law courts drive me mad. Um, and in fact, just as it happens, it just reminded me, I've just, uh, there's a paper coming out in May, I think it is, in Family Law, which is the uh, Family Law Journal, where I've vented 30 years of frustration and anger and bile and um, why the family, family law in this country needs to be radically reformed. It is appalling. It, they are factories for the removal of children. They are adversarial in this country. And um, it came to me just the other day. I had one of my patients, this uh, young teenager, 19, year old, 19 years old with her baby. Well, her, no, a two-year-old. Two, when this two-year-old was a baby, she'd starve the baby, which is why she came to the attention of social services. She hadn't fed the baby properly and eventually came to us. And, um, but she was in a very disturbed state of mind. She was very, very disturbed. Came from a very crazy family. Um, but I went to give evidence in court on her behalf because we had assessed her and thought she needed some treatment. But the judge insisted I, I was there and listened um, to her testimony. As it happens, I can do it in my consult. I can do it uh, through the video link. I do that as much as possible. And I was forced to listen to this young girl for two and a half hours being cross-examined. And I mean, which I'm glad I did. It was horrendous to somebody so vulnerable who was, what do you mean you starved her? It was this attitude, and it was outrageous. I was so angry. When it came to my turn, after listening to two and a half hours, the judge then said, right, it's your turn. I said, no, I'm going for a cup of tea. I'll see you in ten minutes. Goodbye. I was so, I was, if I hadn't have done that, because I, I could do that on my video link, um, which is great. <laughs> and, and the judge realised I, 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 I was very, very critical and, and, uh, and I, I disapproved of how she allowed this girl to be treated. And I, of course, was treated as, as usual in the same way. You know, I'm used to that. Um, and the judge, in the end, gave, gave us what we wanted. But I was outraged at this young girl's experience and what she had been put through. So I've written this paper, which really, uh, the need for massive reform. Um, but it, it all certainly does come from um, analytic work as well, is that, you know, this understanding the disturbance in this girl, rather than treating it as the lawyers were treating, as criminal. They had forgotten, and I had to remind them of the original reports, from the, uh, the other expert, that she was in a very disturbed state of mind. They were just thinking that she was guilty of some horrendous, you know, which she was in a way, it was horrendous what she did, but the understanding was missing, and that's our job in the family court to try and add the understanding. And to be fair, uh, most judges, most of the experienced judges, very much appreciate the analytic perspective. We found that at the council, they appreciate the depth of thought. They find CBT and the other approaches very superficial and they really like the fact that we give very, very detailed reports of children and the, and the inner world of children and the family pathology and we're, we're honest about it. If we don't think we can help, we say so or, or we say, well, it's touch and go. We say so. So I think the depth is appreciated by the judges. Mm -hmm. And you must have been through uh, over the years a certain journey of your own analytically to be able to find the voice with which you could treat a judge like that? I've reached the stage of life where I don't care an e a damn. I really don't. Um, after 30 years of giving evidence in court, and I've been given evidence in I've, I've, you know, the appeal court, even the House of Lords, uh, you know, or it's now the Supreme Court, and, uh, and I've met judges, I know several of them personally, I've just reached the point where I don't care a damn. 
I'll say what that, you know. And it's a privileged position. And obviously I'm not insulting, because then I'll be <laughs> contempt. <laughs> but they need to know. They need to know what we think, you know. And they do appreciate it. And I gather this, this particular outspoken paper has now got the support of the, of the, um, the Association of District Judges. Uh, most of whom have no, no training in child work at all. Um, and, you know, it's, and they're fed up with this adversarial approach. It contrasts to, say, the French approach. Um, I'm not so sure. Maybe the other approaches uh, were in France. For example, I went uh, last October to France to give uh, a couple of papers on the council work to the, the uh, annual... Certainly, I think one of the most extreme experiences of an anxiety provoking situation for me was when I went to an inquest on a young man who committed suicide. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, this is that. Maybe. Maybe. Should you come to the front? Uh, well, if you want. It's just then you can be uh, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, just reflecting upon why we are why we are talking about work in the courts because it's extremely anxiety provoking both to experience and also to contemplate. I mean, for us to sit here and just think about it, um, I think it provokes a lot of anxiety. But I think um, perhaps the reason why your book is so important is because you are addressing something that we all practicing psychoanalysts have to do, which is develop our own particular psychoanalytic home within which we can feel comfortable practicing it. And uh, I think the great thing too is that in this country, where the, the training and the institution is so determined by identification, um, either with Klein or with Anna Freud, that the, the whole predicament for the, the independent group is that we find ourselves feeling and saying things like, and getting subject to anxieties like, does anything go? As if <coughs> there's something wrong with the idea of having an open mind and trying to relate and understand a situation in terms of how it strikes us and how it resonates within us, rather than feeling we've got to impose some kind of model derived from our analytic identity being based on an identification. So I thank you so much for this book because I think it really forces us to think by implication about our own metapsychology, which is, after all, what our psychoanalytic home is partly made up of. In other words, it forces us to think about our theoretical assumptions and really ask deep questions about them. Because if we don't do that, I think we run the risk both of being seduced by something that we've been taught about, such that we lose our capacity to have our own minds, with the corollary that we seduce our patients by a suggestion without realizing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think. Um, for that reason, uh, your many books that you've written about subjectivity are crucial and are impossible to ignore if you've got any respect whatever for creating your own home without it being somewhere mortgaged to someone else. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you. One final question. It determines... One of the things I found very helpful in working out this is how does one translate in English Freud's notion of wo es war, soll ich werden? There are many ways of translating it. And how we each individually translate it tells us a lot about how we work. But thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Jim. <coughs> Do you want to say... Uh, Maybe I have something to say, but please. Um, it's one of the things, you, to get back to the psychoanalytic bit. Um, 
I certainly thought uh, it's, it's obviously subjectivity and the nature of um, the, sub the subject has been one of the themes I've tried to explore. Um, and and tr something was in the air 10, 12, 12, 15 years ago. I remember Eric Rayner saying after he read the book, you're going to have, Roger, you're going to have to wait at least 20 years before anybody will understand what you're talking about, which is interesting. Um, but it did, at that time, it wasn't, there wasn't that much interest. And now it seems subjectivity is something that in other disciplines, and identity as well, uh, everybody seems to be talking about it. In, in, you, know, you can't have a PhD thesis about subjectivity, identity, and otherness or something comes into it. So there's a lot of thought about it. Um, so this were, that, that elusive human subject was an attempt to try and um, define it more. And um, also, I think we need to not, you know, to realize that we're still using the tools of uh, so much Western thought, that, that, that is, you know, and so, so many thinkers have thought about these issues, going back to Plato, that, you know, it's arrogant if we don't try and take account of them and try to bring them into, you know, and, and, and place them. So it was an attempt to, to also, through all that, um, try and see what's analytically uh, uh, relevant. Um, yeah, that's enough for now. Vincenzo. Yes, I could add something about the, the last question about uh, terminology. And uh, it is not mm, just by chance, I think, that uh, one of the characteristics of the um, independent tradition, and it is very odd that I, as Italian, as to be the advocate of the independent <laughs> British independent tradition, but uh, what is characteristic is the, the um, searching for new meaning of uh, old or uh, saturated term. So I think that uh, uh, psychoan uh, British psychoanalysis, I am now cutting the, the text uh, too strongly, but uh, to be brief, was so to say entrapped by the theory, the object relation theory, because uh, it was a conception that the patient was an object, so to say, and the subject, the unnominated subject, was the analyst. And that's why I think it's particularly interesting that uh, 12 years ago, as you were telling before, uh, you came through this term, subject, which is very, very mm, <coughs> elusive as a concept because you cannot grasp the real meaning of what it is about. And I am also reminded of uh, uh, another part of Bola's, uh, Kit Bola's uh, book in which he says, uh, what it is that thing that we call self, uh, which is uh, in the same area of trying to understand the real meaning of, uh, um, of world. And it is not by chance that uh, another British psychoanalyst like uh, John Clauber used uh, for the first time the term encounter instead of relationship. So what I'm meaning is that the independent tradition characterized itself for uh, a sort of uh, being attentive to the real meaning of what is happening in the human person, in the analytic relationship. And I would make a difference here, for example, between the clear-cut way in which Melanie Klein treated the subject of projective identification, meaning that you put something inside another body, and the way in which Winnicott and all the independent tradition uh, treat the theme that it, it seems to me it's very um, similar to what you say in your book and also what uh, Michael says in his book, what we would call a primary identification, which implies also a sort of very flexible boundaries between the subject and the object or between two subjects. So um, it is particularly welcome, and I now come to your question, that some British psychoanalysts are reflecting on the uh, 
how can I say, the, the depth of the concept of Freud um, induced by Strachey translation. And it is not only the case of Nachtraglikite, was, which was uh, lost in British psychoanalysis because uh, uh, deferred action has nothing to do with Nachtraglikite, but also, for example, with the term ego, which does not exist in not only in the terminology of Freud, but also was a term taken from the Latin. So, ego is a well-shaped form which has well-established boundaries, and it is not elusive. And when Freud used ich, he wanted to indicate this elusiveness of the concept. So, the sentence that I would not be able to say in German would be translated in English as we would be <laughs> would translate it in Italian. Where it was, I will become, and not the ego will become. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, Lacan uh, makes that point, doesn't he? Really. There's another important thing about that sentence, I think, which connects with Roger's thought, which is the word werden. Wo es war, soll ich werden. He doesn't say, wo es war, soll ich sein, which would be, where it was, shall the I will be. He said, werden, where, where the it was, I will become. Mm -hmm. And it's that ongoing development, which we think probably doesn't have a conclusion, that I think you're very aware of yeah. in your writing, Roger. Was the, the, the idea of becoming a subject, exactly. which uh, actually I took from Thomas Ogden, that was a phrase of his, um, but it seemed to capture something that, um, you know, one's trying to do really in, in, with, with, with the patient. Um, I mean, there is, one doesn't want to overemphasize the fact, the, the, the freedom and the uncertainty and the becoming, because at the same time, as you yourself say, you, you need discipline, you need also the, the other, the more deterministic aspects mm -hmm. as well. It's, it's or the, 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 you know, the actual discipline, which can take years, so that you, you, even, as I said, even if you don't know what you're doing, at least you know what it is you're not doing. <laughs> rather than rather than you just don't know what you're doing which uh, you start out not knowing what you're doing yeah. <laughs> let's hear some more voices yes do you want to come up and uh, no okay all right okay all right I've heard talking to that some people will hear I'm really impressed uh, um, from uh, your work uh, because um, I find it very difficult. Uh, for example, when I, I'm listening to some patients, I think, uh, thanks God, I have not uh, to tell my thoughts or my opinion about uh, the, their, the effect of their comportment in the, in the society. Because uh, it is very, very different, uh, the, the understanding of the patient and uh, the um, decision to say something in a very clear way, uh, knowing that it, in a, it will influence the cult, the tages. I find that it's, it's really a very difficult uh, uh, situation and really um, I wanted uh, if you can to tell a little more about uh, what you have seen as a result during the, uh, your uh, year of uh, doing this uh, um, this uh, work. And uh, if the only thing I, I want to add is that uh, you began for, from Dostoevsky, and uh, I, I remember a once that uh, he wrote that. Uh, uh, the, um, even the, the sight, the, the, the look of uh, a doctor who was understanding towards the criminals uh, can put uh, a sperm and uh, who knows which tree will become after from the, uh, the one look who uh, tries to understand without asking the criminals. Uh, I find it very, very important. 
Okay. Yes, I, um, I'm not, yes, uh, can I just hold on a minute, see if there's anybody else, and, yeah. Just a question, I, I wonder if also the analysts are not aware that the subject interacting with the patient, analyzing the patient, if also the analyst becomes a subject. I mean, if it's a two-way process. Well, absolutely. Sorry? Yeah. I mean, we rely, uh, we rely on our patients, not just for our income, but also for our life, our inner life, uh, in many ways. Hopefully not totally, because then that will be problematical. But for our creativity, our uh, professional uh, acknowledgement, we rely on, on patients. So we, obviously our whole identity is dependent on the patient in many ways, uh, as well as colleagues, of course, and, and all the other aspects. But uh, it's a very, uh, I've, I've been asked to write a paper on the, the, the loneliness of the analyst. It's, uh, and I've only just been asked about that, so I'm just beginning to think about it. But uh, Montaigne has written a, an essay on solitude, and he recommends everybody has a back room in their shop. <laughs> and that's a bit what it's like as a psychoanalyst. You need a back room in your shop <laughs> in order to, uh, you know, which develops and, and has various... Uh, Goods on on I don't know on sale anyway you populate it becomes populated in order in order to succeed as an analyst I suppose in one's life one's career you reliant on on patients hopefully obviously uh, a certain number get better as I said in a book somewhere it's wrong to rely on patients to get better because if you keep relying on that then obviously that the you there's a need from the analyst for recognition, but if none of your patients get better, one earth are you an analyst? <laughs> because obviously one's also doing it for all kinds of complex reasons, but there is a healing aspect. Uh, and, and a real trust, I think, isn't it? A trust in the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And a, tr a trust in the process, that it is in itself healing. It's a bit, sometimes, I mean, this is why I, I, I'm allergic to, to these presentations where the analyst is all-knowing and knows what's going on and gives the right interpretation and oh, it's wonderful, you know. And, and they seem in total command of the whole situation. It's, what are they like as parents? <laughs> you know, it's a bit similar in a way, being a parent. <coughs> there are times when you have to be clear there have to be times when you have to give boundaries, but also mm -hmm. many times when you have to allow whatever is going to happen, happen. You are just, you're just a host. And certainly my children, uh, I've experienced of complete otherness with at least two of them. Uh, completely, completely other. And if you, if you don't accept that and allow them and realize you're just a kind of a host to, to these souls, to these, you know, to grow, then I think you're in deep trouble. And there's something a bit similar, really, I think, in analysis. You know, you allow a space uh, uh, for the patient to, to grow, but in a way it's a trust in the process, isn't it? And in the setting mm -hmm. and, and the work that this will happen. Um, and I think that must be conveyed, I suppose, to the patient, really, that you know, there is that trust, even when you're going through terrible times, you know, I think. Ask about uh, two other books. One is uh, Lacan, the yes. influence of Lacan on psychoanalysis. The other one, your, your work on reconstruction. Thank you. Okay. Lacan and history. Lacan, of course, is part of my history. Uh, Lacan was through uh, a personal, personal involvement with uh, the uh, Bice Benvenuto, the Italian, Lacanian now. Uh, I got to know Lacan at a time when he was, he was unknown in England, virtually unknown except um, a few French departments. Mm -hmm. Whereas in France and Italy, well, it was through Italy that uh, and Napoli actually that I discovered about Lacan. He he was a big figure, 
And in France, you had to, if you wanted to seduce a woman, you had to speak French. Uh, Lacan, Lacan. You had to speak Lacanese. This is what the joke was. You had to, you know, if you wanted a chance, you had to be able to speak about Lacan. <laughs> Only the French could uh, seduce with Lacan. Um, so I became interested in, in his ideas. And I, I also, but uh, I had to, in order to understand him, I had to uh, re research continental philosophy, which I was at that time completely ignorant. So I had spent some years reading Hegel and Heidegger and uh, etc., Cuget, all kinds of people, in order to understand Lacan. And then we wrote this book, which was the, Eng the English person's guide to Lacan. <laughs> <laughs> which was, because at that time people were writing frang, I call it franglais, you know, this, this dreadful uh, kind of uh, English that was a mixture of Lacan's French and English, which was incomprehensible. So the idea was to try and write an introduction that would explain uh, uh, Lacan fairly simply. Originally it was going to be something called a Fontana Modern Master, but Frank Kermode didn't want the book because it was too much about psychoanalysis. <laughs> so we eventually, after failing with approximately 30 publishers, free associations books, took it on as one of their first books. But Lacan, for me, was not only my personal history, but I did spend a lot of my analysis, I think, talking about Lacan. And I remember my uh, complaining about the British Society, and I remember my analyst saying, I've never heard anybody complain so much about the training as I had. <laughs> Although I remember, he, I can still hear his voice, Dr. Kennedy. I know this training is pretty awful at times, but I've never heard anybody to complain as much as you complain. <laughs> also, the other thing he said, just go ahead and write it. I remember this is typical of Clauber. Just go ahead and do it. You know, in the end, they'll all admire you for it. Just do it, never mind what they say. And he also he said, to be, you know, to be, if you're going to be creative, it doesn't matter what the British Institute do, you will be creative. You just get on with it and do your own thing and don't let them, don't let the buggers get to you, <laughs> basically. So, you know, you have to do your, you have to do whatever you're going to have to do, you know, um, which was a useful bit of advice. <coughs> the other thing is about history, um, which was the topic of one of my books, Psychoanalysis, Psychoanalysis, History and Subjectivity. I make a distinction there between the history of events and history of layers. The history of events is traditional history, the, the narrative of the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, you have a good story, which is very popular in this country, particularly it sells very well in these narrative histories, which I like reading. But the analytic history is about the history of layers, which is more Freud's archaeology, which is different layers from the past, the present, intermingle. And that's the kind of analytic history that, that, that we deal with so, so much. Um, and, uh, yeah. Melanie, did I see you wanted to say something? Uh, what I, you, you mentioned, um, you said a sentence. I think it went something about we need other subjects. We need the network of other subjects in order to organize our own minds. Yes. And I, I was intrigued by that because I, it seems to me that you're using subject there as an extremely powerful and complex way to mean what it is about another human mind or presence in the life, for instance, of an infant that allows the infant mind to extend itself. And I, I just thought that was terribly interesting, that we need a network of minds that have that capacity to extend the infant's mind. Uh, and that's not the same as being a person, it's something to do peculiar Some people are natural at it, and obviously like some mothers are naturally able to know what, what to do in that way. At the castle I see most mothers who can't, who have no sense of allowing subjectivity or becoming a subject. It's closed for them. And um, so it's partly from seeing how, when it really fails, uh, they require part of the community aspect of the work is a network mm -hmm. of, of subjects of other people and friendships and relationships and that, through that network they begin to understand for the first time something about a, a baby. It's interesting how it, through that process. Um, 
but I, I think there are certain people who, I mean, probably many people who find it natural, like mothers who can, who can understand that's what's required of being with the baby. You can see the attunement, you can see the, the naturalness of it. But for, for others, it just it seems to fail, and um, they need a lot of help. We're talking about a network of other people who know something about what being a subject means. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, aren't we? And that makes me think of your theatre work, which is something we haven't come across, uh, we haven't spoken of yet. There's yet another voice chapter uh, in Roger's Many Voices book about the theatre because Roger's been a theatre writer and director as well? Um, I, I only only uh, uh, an amateur director, although I directed the, the, the couple of plays put on a bit. The, the thought that came to me is whether, whether you think it would be true to say that theatre is a, an area where what you're doing, or in your experience did you find that you're writing, was about theatre as a way of exploring what it means to be a subject and how you know, another uh, avenue of thinking about how to become one. I'd, I'd never really thought of that, but I think you're right. I mean, to write... I mean, I wrote for theatre years and years ago uh, and had a couple of things on years ago. And then I have just only a few months ago wrote a play for the first time. Um, about f uh, I don't know why it suddenly happened, so it's in my mind again. But to write for the theatre, simply if technically, is a particular technique which you have to imagine the other voices. You ha that's what I find. It's, it's like poetry, it's, quite, uh, it's a particular way of writing. It's nothing like prose. If you write prose, you can't write, mm -hmm. you know, you can't write a play. Whatever it is, you have to imagine the other voices and, and, uh, and what they would say and then see what happens. Some people know, I mean, I just write the voices and then see what happens. Uh, that's my take. I mean, other people have a clear plot. Mm -hmm. I have a vague plot, but um, basically I get the people together and then see what they're going to say to each other. Six characters in search for an author by Yes. is a good example yes. of this looking for... Yes. Well, it goes back to the basis of, of Western subjectivity through the, after all, through the, through the theatre, through the chorus uh, and, you know, Greek tragedy where, you know, where the, the role of the chorus gradually increased and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, it was a sacred, it wasn't entertainment so much as something involving the whole community in something sacred in a way, wasn't it, I think? It wasn't just like we go to, to be entertained. Yeah. It was something in which the different, different citizens, the different people would become integrated together in some way by seeing something tragic or being together and seeing something comic. Um, so it, 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 I suppose theatre has that long, deep history. Uh, Hannah Arendt talks about the importance of the, ma the persona, in, well, translated uh, into Latin from um, the Greek pros I can't remember the word now pros uh, pro pro yeah. Pro yeah, the mask I mean, they had the mask but through the mask they were able to show who they were mm. so the irony of and I, I, in, that's in the, pa in the book as well in the, in the human aspects the analysts have a mask too and yet having of the mask is a powerful way that in fact, the truth can come out. Without the mask, you can't be, you can't do psychoanalysis, because if you ma if you don't mask your, you, yourself, you can't be an analyst. And yet, from time to time, yourself, your person comes out from the mask. Mm -hmm. But the masking function is a vital bit of of the work, the analytic work. So there's something that goes back, not just Oedipus and all that, <laughs> but really to the the birth of Western thought and uh, really, so, you know, in, in the work that we're doing. I mean, it's a bit like the theatre in analysis, isn't it? The house lights go down, maybe it's, uh, you know, we, we, you're not in the dark, but there's a special setting, quiet, subdued lighting, I have subdued lighting, you know, the lights go out, and then somebody begins talking. I think there's a very close connection, in fact, between the transitional space of the analytic 
setting where if one thinks of transference, what it's all about is uh, a relationship and things happening that have an absolute powerful reality of their own, of a sort which is different mm -hmm. from the everyday reality of life outside that specific setting. Transference has to be real, otherwise it's got no meaning. But the important thing is that one knows that it's not real, otherwise it becomes a, a psychotic transference. And I think one could talk in very similar terms about the, the stage space as a transitional space where relationships and what happens have a reality which is absolutely authentic and yet when you go out into mm -hmm. the street after the performance you know perfectly well it wasn't true. I think it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Well, my first paper, I suppose, first paper I wrote, analytic paper, was called The Dual Aspect of the Transference. Um, and yeah. that was very much, it resonates with what you're saying, that, um, you know, the idea of you are and you aren't at the same time. The analyst is both a transference object and not a transference object. It was about a particular patient who found this dual aspect very difficult. You know, I had to be one thing or another thing. You know, the idea that I could be shifting was something she found very, very difficult and I, when I pointed this out it seemed to make some sense. But I was very young. Was, I, actually it was before, I wrote it before I was qualified so it was my, one of my first, my first thing. Um, I have to say I never, because we're coming to an end, I never actually thought I would ever write anything about psychoanalysis, I can tell you. I remember telling my analyst, because uh, I was writing a bit for the theatre, I said well I don't think I'm ever going to write anything about psychoanalysis. I think that's most unlikely. <laughs> I don't know quite what happened in the in the gap. <laughs> I've always been very fond of that. Roger's saying that it's his first analytic paper. I actually quoted that paper of yours in my first analytic paper. <laughs> yeah. So it's a bond that goes a long way back. Now, as Roger was saying, we're coming to an end. We've just got five more minutes if Anybody else has thoughts burning a hole in your pocket? Now, now is the time to come out with them. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just found it rather depressing that you say you, you, you just said it as a passing remark, and you probably, when you think about it again, don't mean it. But what you said just now was that you can't be yourself when you're working as an analyst? Not totally. No, no, what I meant was, no, no, what I meant the personal. No, I mean, I feel myself. No, no, I mean, you have to, the mark, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, uh, my younger son just had a good football match today. You know, I mean, that's what I mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not going to be saying that to my patients. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly a mask. I agree. It's okay. Not uh -huh. It's a muting or a, something like that. Mm. You agree to mute something or to hold it. It's not a mask. I also I share exactly yeah. that feeling. Uh huh. Or well, maybe it's something else. I don't know. I'll think about that. But uh, I mean, there are other times when I mean, particularly ill patients, I have to be a mask. I think. I mean, they can't bear my uh, reality. My, you know, the ordinariness. It's terrifying. I have to be very careful. It's not a mask. Uh, restraint. Mm -hmm. Is what is it? I wonder what if the idea of Montaigne's back room may help. Because the idea of a psychic home, being at home in one's own body, in oneself, but also keeping a back room. The sense of being at home, but also having a place, not exactly a mask, but somewhere else where maybe again the elusiveness, the kind of at home, but an unheimlich quality of being at home as well. Thank you. The last track is rather well. Um, okay, well, I, I, see, I, see two, I see two more hands up. I'm bit, I'm bit I've obviously hand. touched something. Yeah. Something has been touched. Yes. I, can we hear very briefly from these two people, and then I'll ask Roger and Vincenzo to, to bring us to an end. I wonder what's the, the attraction of talking about the mask itself. I thought it was all about the, the space between the mask and the face. And you do like this with the mask, you put it on and off. But it's not so that you were discussing, is it a mask or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And there's one more comment or question. What do you think about those voices which are never to express because they are bodily? And because uh, yeah. we 
we are resonant to them within our body, or with our embodied Kanka transference. Yes. We bring out the hidden story yes. on the deep layer of the I, I, I absolutely agree with you and I, I often feel bodily things mm -hmm. in, I mean I haven't gone into that I mean other people have written I recommend Francoise Dotto's uh, L'image uh, inconscient du corps mm -hmm. uh, The Unconscious Image of the Body um, she's brilliant on that I mean it's not something I, I mean a lot of other people have talked about but I, I would absolutely go along with with you that, uh, that uh, the body is really important, even though, yeah, and how patients are with their bodies on the couch, I find very important, very important. If they're like this or if they're freer and so on. Uh, it's just not something I personally have theorized too much about, although I've talked about um, the importance of embodiment for the subject, for becoming a subject. And there was an example in my, paper, my chapter, Becoming a Subject, which is all about the body, with a, wom mm -hmm. with a woman who is bulimic, so I talk very much all about that there. So. Uh, so thank you all very much. I'll just ask Vincent. So do you have any? any no. You want just to say one final thing? comment. Maybe the term mask is not the best one, <laughs> but uh, I want to relate it to the persona because. Uh, the, the mask is also the way in which in the theater, yeah. the, the persona, and persona means personare, to sound through. So yeah. it is a right. way of communicating something, but uh, concealing what is the privacy of the person. So I think that uh, the important fact about the mask is that uh, the analyst does not invade what is the space for the patient. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Roger, do you want to say I am I'm very grateful to, to Mike, as Chen Vincenzo, for your, all your generous comments. And um, for those of you who have managed to survive this late on such a tiring day, I'm, I'm very admiring of you. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.